Okay, so it's time now for um, the last area of study, RSA 2, and uh, we're going to look at DNA manipulation particularly. And then there seems to be an interesting new idea of um, the social, ethical, and biological implications of the use of, of science. So, how do we impact on biological processes? Um, let me check that, yeah. <clears throat> so, this is, a lot of this is uh, classic Unit 4 in the past. Um, the second part, not so much. So, restriction enzymes. And I'm in the way again. What am I going to do myself? I keep getting in the way. Um, restriction enzymes were discovered to exist within um, bacteria for the very purpose of destroying viruses. Because bacteria, of course, also need to protect themselves. They need some sort of immune system by which to stop themselves being um, chomped up by viruses. So they can actually cut the virus DNA up and stop it inserting itself into the bacterial DNA. So really useful little opportunity for us then to start playing with it. And we can do things like chop DNA. This is a blunt end. This is what we call a sticky end. Sticky ends generally are preferred because it's easier to recombine them. Blunt ends, oh, actually that's step one. Blunt ends look like that and it's a bit hard to get them back together again. Um, We'll talk about those in a minute. If this changes for me, does my change for me? Oh, no, it did change for me. I just realized. Okay, let's go back. Let's make sure I've not done no. Where are we? Okay. Sorry, getting confused. Um, so, the uh, what else do you need to know about them? So, they're an enzyme, they cut up DNA, first found in bacteria, well, found in bacteria. And uh, we have a naming convention, which often occurs on the exam. So the very, very first one that was ever found was found in Escherichia coli, E. coli. E. coli is used a lot. And it's common, and it's easy to play with, easy to breed up. So they were actually isolated within um, E. coli. And uh, it therefore gets the name Echo R1. E for Escherichia, CO for coli, R, they dump, dump the R after a while, for restriction enzyme. And one was the first one. Um, so the first one taken from Athrobacter luteus was called LU1. And we'll, we'll play there on those. We've got some activities to see how that works. Pretty straightforward stuff. Really useful material. And we'll talk about the basics later. Uh, of course, having cut the DNA, you need then to put it back together again. And we know that ligase appears, exists for that reason. In nature and we're able to isolate ligase and use it with restriction enzymes to in fact repair and put together DNA. So you can cut it where you want to, you can insert a piece of DNA from where you want it and then put it all back together with ligase using natural processes for our own purposes. Um, polymerase chain reaction is another wonderful technique that essentially um, uses a lot of this Depending on what you want to do, you can either take a sample of a particular gene and um, using PCR make thousands of copies very quite quickly, or you can actually sequence a whole person's DNA and again create lots of copies quite quickly. Um, when I was at university many years ago, in you know, the old days, we used to do this by hand because um, we had to keep putting in new polymerase because it would get heated. People discovered a polymerase called TAC polymerase. So T for thermos, AQ for aquaticus. So thermos aquaticus is an extremophile, lives in um, deep sea vents and things, and capable of being, you know, operating at a whole range of temperatures and quite hot temperatures. So because PCR requires um, raising the temperature to disassociate DNA to about 90 degrees Celsius, and then cooling it back to 55, and then raising it to 70 again, and doing this over and over again, Having a polymerase like TAC became, made this whole thing quite easy to automate. And so instead of a whole bunch of water baths and moving materials by hand, this little box does the job for you. So uh, it's quite easy to make a lot of copies of PCR, of, of um, DNA quite quickly. Um, so fantastic little technique. Oh, I've got stages for you. So stage one, denaturation. So DNA is heated to about 95 degrees Celsius and the hydrogen bonds are broken. We obviously, we use this idea in um, hybridization as well. Attach your primers so you can find out which bits are working um, and cool it to about 50 degrees Celsius. This causes things to bind again. And then you raise it back to 72 
and the new strands are then built and completed. And you just go through stage one, stage two, stage three, over and over and over again. And this machine will sit there and churn away for hours doing it for you. And it's just like a, um, ink in a printer, you've got cartridges full of the nucleotides required. Um, so a wonderful little pro uh, technique for moving things quite quickly. Gyrotrophoresis is always a stalwart of the exam. Knowing how it works is really important, so we'll do some gels in class. We'll run some gels in class. So essentially, you've got a piece of um, agar, an agar material, with wells that are put in with a comb. We'll show you how to do all that works. And those wells you then load up with your samples. This sits in a buffer solution, which is um, a salty water solution, basically. It's a bit more complex than that, but essentially that's all it is, because the salty water allows a charge to run. Now, because DNA is slightly negatively charged, if I attach the negative um, electrode to this end and the positive electrode to that end, the laws of electrostatics tell me that negative to negative will repel, and so my DNA will start creeping that way, and negative to positive will be attracted, so it's going to be repelled from one end and attracted to the other end, and it will move its way through the gel. The bigger the fragment, the slower it moves. Pretty states forward, isn't it? Um, and so we get these lovely patterns showing chunks of DNA. Really simple process. And of course, we've chunked out that DNA using restriction enzymes, because we want to know precisely where we've cut, and we also work out how big they are. I'll show that in a minute. Having chopped them up, it's pretty important to be able to put them back together so you can do something useful. So some of the early work, most of the work still is in agriculture because it's, it's a really useful way of genetically modifying organisms to improve their um, viability for certain things, give them resistance to disease or resist, resistance, resistance to a herbicide so we can spray the crop and not kill the crop, just kill the weeds, that sort of thing. Um, insulin was one of the first ones that was used for humans. We you know, produce uh, insulin in bacteria in broths rather than having to kill pigs was a, a big step forward. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, I've got, um, in this case here, we've got agrobacterium tumefescens, and we've got the plasmid from it, so it's the bacteria. We've taken this plasmid, and we've found the restriction site we know how to cut. So we've cut that restriction site. We've got the DNA that uh, has the gene we want for whatever, um, better tomatoes. And we've inserted that DNA by cutting this. We've cut this out of the... Um, where have we found it from? It could be a tomato itself. We've cut it into this plasmid. So now it contains that gene. And we introduce the plasmid into the plant cell. And the um, plant DNA takes up this new gene and starts to express it. And the intent is a crop with better tomatoes or whatever. In the case of insulin, we taught E. coli to make insulin. We gave it human insulin gene. So this, is, this could be an E. coli plasmid with human insulin gene, and of course it expresses, we've got cause it to express the gene, and it creates insulin, which we then just harvest from the, the, um, the agar plates or the broth. So a really simple technique, really useful. Viruses also make great vectors, and the first time we used this idea was with uh, cystic fibrosis, an attempt to help those people with cystic fibrosis. So you attenuate the virus, obviously, but you change its DNA to contain the DNA you want to transfer. In this case of cystic fibrosis, it was the correct cystic fibrosis gene. And it was then able to be injected by this virus. So you take a puffer, sniff up, sniff up the, um, the viruses, and they would inject the correct gene for correct mucus production into the lungs of the sufferer. Um, unfortunately, the epithelial tissues die quite rapidly and you had to keep using this, the, um, the, the puffers, and in time it became another cause of concern, and uh, they stopped using it, sadly. But a really clever idea. But viruses are often used as a way of transferring a vector to transfer your to a changed gene. And that was a quick one, wasn't it? It's finished already.